Good evening, presenting this evening. Uh, we've got Jack Queen uh, from Chapman Taylor, Daniel from Wilson, Wilson Mason, and we've got a couple of um, we've got some suggestions from Andrew as well as some as well as some suggestions from myself as well. Um, so. Hands, just by a show of hands, how many people use apps in revenue now? The good majority of you then. I think if I'd have asked that question maybe only two years ago, I think the majority of people would have said no. Yeah, it's become a really big uh, developing area for Autodesk and for all sorts of software development uh, packages. Obviously, we're all very used to it with mobile phones and so forth, but we're in support increasingly seeing that um, idea appear in design technologies like Revit. And it's usually by a third party, although Autodesk themselves, to be fair, do create their own applications, which you can add on. And it's always amazing to me how many people, especially you, especially you that are paying for subscription or maintenance contracts, whatever they're calling it these days, um, those of you who are paying for those sort of additional fees that Autodesk charge, a lot of you don't realize that sometimes that you have access to an entire app library um, that can fulfill all sorts of uh, fulfill all sorts of niches, uh, which are worth checking out. And it is usually about fulfilling a niche. It's usually aimed at a sort of small group of people, you know, that want to do a specific a specific task. Okay. Um, it can be free. It can be a one-off. Or it can be a subscription. Um, I've, I've been asking this question for a couple of years now. You know, people have commented about possibly the slowdown of the Revit development in the last couple of years or so. You know, for me, Revit development hasn't slowed down, it's just shifted elsewhere. <laughs> you know, it's, um, it's, it's actually shifted into this app market, if you like, and, and we're seeing a lot of the things that we want to do in Revit starting instead of being part of, part, instead of being part of the core functionality of the software, is now starting to become, you know, peripheral uh, pieces of the software that we install on, which IT managers absolutely love. <laughs> yeah, the amount of IT companies I've been into, uh, amount of companies I've been into and spoken to the IT managers now, and they're going, "Yeah, it's great, but not having any." Um, so you need to have that conversation because people are losing a lot of losing a lot, as I'm sure the presentation will help to show, losing a lot of uh, valuable uh, valuable access. So we're going to show a number of apps today, and okay, I'm not going to present them off. I'm going to hand over to a couple of other people. Um, I won't read all that out, but it gives you an idea of where we're going. You know, it won't, it won't, it won't be a, it's never going to be the whole library, but hopefully it gives you an idea. Okay, with that, I think I'll hand over to. Hello, everyone. Hi. Uh, so, I'll be sharing a couple of apps that I tend to use on my day to day tasks at work. So, uh, mostly dealing with model management and quality. The first one would be the Family Size Reporter. It's a fairly recent app. I think it was released in last November. What it allows you is to have a quick list of all loadable families in your current uh, Revit model. So why is this good? Well, you, if you feel that all of a sudden your model file has increased a lot, it may be that some may accidentally just download, let's say, a manufacturer's family, which comes with all the nuts and bolts and probably copy across the entire project and by running this family you, you you can quickly check if there are some offending families say families with 5 meg or 10 meg just loaded into your Revit model before I, w I started to use this app or, or what I did was just I, I exported all loadable families into a folder I needed to wait for that process to finish so that I could go to the Windows Explorer and check the, the, the file size for each. This one, without just leaving Revit, you just leave it running. Uh, again, it's a very uh, simple app. You can list um, the families by size and by category. Uh, although I actually emailed the guys and they are keen to develop the, the family, taking it a bit further, say, for instance, if exporting all that information to a CSV to perform other types of analysis. <coughs> Next one is the batch family loader from the CTC BIM manager suite. Uh, this is part of the uh, free version. They have a paid and a free version, the CTC uh, tools. So um, 
why is this uh, go, uh, good for? So let's say that you have a couple of families that you modeled separately and you have a couple of files that you want to load that family into. Uh, at Chapman Teller we tend to work with fairly large projects and usually we have more just one Revit model for one project. So in order to keep the family sync, meaning using the exact same family version in all models, um, you can quickly use this app. So what you have here is at the, oops, sorry, <laughs> at the top you can include all the model files that you want to load the families into and here you can just load all families that you want to load into the project files above. Uh, just one word of caution. Uh, especially if you're working with work shared files, this app will open directly the central file. So if you want to do this, just make sure that no, no one is accessing the central file at the moment that you're loading the families. <coughs> the next one is the family tracker. It provides you also a list of all the families in the project, although I have been using it mostly to list all the groups that are loaded in, in, in the project. Um, more specifically, detail groups and model groups. We have done some testing and they can increase the file size a lot and the slowness of the model because of that. So what it does is, that, again, you can list all the detail groups and model groups for that uh, that are being uh, used on that um, project file. And then you can also export to, the, to CSV and, for instance, just get a count of how many groups of a particular type do you have. <coughs> uh, if everyone is running this tool, and uh, I forgot to mention, this is part of the Kiwi bonus tool. tools. Okay. It's not a free app. There's a 21-day trial. I yeah, It starts with a 25 quid yearly subscription, although it's a standalone, so if you have it in one computer, can't have it on the other one. But let's say that your company is doing fairly well and you install it across the company uh, and everyone is using it. So whenever someone loads a new family or updates the family, that family gets a tag so you know exactly when it was changed and who changed the family. <coughs> the next one, also part of the Kiwi bonus tools, is the uh, referencing file list where you can if you, if you use this tool, you can have a, a quick view of everything that is loaded, whether it is linked or imported into the model. Especially, for instance, you might have spent some time just trying to look for that cut import that was placed in one of the 500 views that the model has. You really can't find it. Well, this one allows you to just look for the cut import. It tells you stuff, uh, things like uh, if it's an import or a link, if it's imported or linked to current view only or not and by looking at the work set column you can you can read where in which view was that uh, uh, import placed or uh, imported <coughs> or this one swap groups for families uh, i tend to use it together with the family tracker and how, uh, how do i do it so I go to the family tracker and I get a list of detail groups or model groups. And for this case, for detail groups, so, okay, um, some users who don't know or don't remember to create detail item families, which are far, w which the file size is far lower than just having a detail group sitting in the, in the project model. So they just catch a couple of lines or field regions, they, they group them, create a detail group and start copying that across. That has a huge impact on the on the model size and speed. So what these tools allow allows is that okay, if you identify a particular detail group that you can see that, wait a minute, I can quickly convert this into a detail item family. So you, you create your detail item family, you load it into your project and just run the tool and say this detail group gets replaced by this detail, this detail item family and it deletes all the detail groups in that model. <coughs> this one is a subscription only <coughs> app. Uh, started to use this when we need to issue some models. Uh, it makes it very quick to just 
pinpoint, uh, pinpoint a, a particular model file that you want to um, that you want to issue. So you browse to the folder where the file is at. It can detach the file. Uh, it can purge the file, include all the links or not, include sheets or not, and purge the file, and, and then it copies it to the model issuing folder. And then you have a, a copy of that project file that can be issued to the external consultants or whoever. <coughs> Uh, another one is the import and ex export Excel from BIM1. This this one is free. Um, sometimes, for, for instance, we've used it a couple of times, say, for um, win uh, window or door tags. Like, they want to include a prefix or a suffix to the already number of a particular window. Um, they, could, they could go to Revit and just open a schedule and do copy-paste in every single row. Uh, whereas if you use this tool, um, I've used a couple of ones, by the way. The Kiwi Bonus Tools also has an import-export in Excel, but it did, my experience is that the results were not as great as using this one. So what you tend to use, how I tend to use it, is that I export the schedule to Excel, just add a couple of formulas or whatever I need to do to the, to the schedule, and then import it back in. Because the... The, these apps usually tend to use the, um, the element ID in the background. So if you provide that you're using the exact same file that was exported, things will eventually run smoothly. <coughs> Fingers crossed, of course. <coughs> and uh, thank you for your time. That's it. <coughs> Any questions, Mr. Quinn? Oh, yeah, sorry. Sorry, this one? Uh, BIM1 has a couple of apps. I've been using this one from, from them, yeah. BIM, BIM Link, so that's the is Excel it? linking software. I think, well, yeah. I think the, probably one of the main differences is the cost. <laughs> uh, obviously, BIM Link is a, quite an expensive acquisition, but I think BIM Link is an extremely capable piece of software in terms <coughs> of linking. Correct me if I'm wrong, Joe Quinn, this is quite a basic link, is it? Yes. To Excel, so you can't yes. ask templates and stuff like that. Uh, I never tried. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so, can't so it's ask an interesting really question. Accident. I don't think we know feature for that feature. Okay. Thanks very much. Thank you very much. So the page line types it came about from actually probably everyone would be shocked in the room of uh, just importing too many CAD details and CAD plans and then people exploding them um, and finding the file size becomes massive. Um, so it was found from, from an error um, and then uh, it plugs in free and then it means that you just tidy up uh, a lot of mess that comes from that um, that a normal page wouldn't do. Um, and again the hatch kit, um, there's, also, there's a few of them. Um, this one, uh, the hatch kit add-in um, came about from ex again exploding CAD uh, drawings and the file size becoming too big so it helped purge out any um, fill regions that appeared and you couldn't get rid of uh, but then subsequently uh, if you have got a specific pattern that you don't want to model straight away uh, it can bring in a, a quite complex uh, pattern that you can put onto what you need to put it on and then it can develop further so it's again just speeding up processes um, and at the same time not really uh, spending money because uh, if we've got a, we've got to feel like we've prove, proven a app before we uh, shell out for it and that's me um, so I'm going to present this report uh, so Andrew, um, I'm going to look. I'm going to look in Andrew's direction quite often during this next bit because what he sent me was a, it was a very comprehensive solution to a problem which I thought was absolutely brilliant. So I'm going to try and do it justice, and I'll look at Andrew every now and again to make sure I'm getting it right. <laughs> so, um, so it was. Uh, so RDS parameters uh, using our tools. Um, which, as you can see, has got a cost of about $100. Um, it's not a workflow I personally use, but um, how Fairhurst have been using their particular application 
is it allows them to set up a key schedule within the Revit software, which is a room-based key schedule, where they can assign um, their information, such as uh, such as features of that room and so forth, and that department. Um, it can be it can it can be then exported to Excel, it's a bit like the IBA software, and anybody within that team can actually can actually go and edit and put their information into the room data sheet within the Excel in the Excel software. Bear in mind this is a hundred dollars. Obviously, we've got the likes of Codebook and Derofus and things like that, but they're a lot more expensive as uh, as uh, as uh, tool sets. And it does seem that this tool is the way that Fairhurst has managed to utilize it seems to be going some way at least to the functionalities that are available in those much more expensive uh, software solutions. Um, so what they were able to do is obviously they've got the key schedule for the rooms. So they build up uh, what's going on in that room in there. Uh, that's just I'm hungry. Um, I, I'm hungry. Yeah, so you can use the door schedules as well and that's more. Yeah, so this so it's a similar idea with the door schedules then. You build the item hungry key schedules um, and then they're assigning uh, they're assigning those key schedules to the actual objects. You can export that out to the uh, to the Excel software, very much like IDA and all those kinds of softwares. And you get an Excel spreadsheet that anybody can edit and work with. What's really clever is that when they bring it back in, they've been able to what is basically a big room tag, is that right? So a very big room tag, um, which is essentially a formatted RDS or a formatted room data sheet. And it's calling out all those shared parameters that they're editing in the, through, the, through that tool set. And eventually, they're able to get to that with a hundred dollar tool, which I think is pretty amazing actually. But it's, um, but yeah, it seems like a very capable solution. Definitely want to investigate for those of you who are doing room data sheets. And so. Any questions on that one? Did I do it justice? <laughs> how did it know? How did it know the items inside the rooms? Is it purely based on the space tab? Um, well, so, so you're basically doing a room data schedule, um, and the the, the plugin tool actually maps those shared parameters to the Excel sheet, which allows you to. Um, Allows anyone to change that, whether you're doing it to commit to a consultant or anyone. When you load it back in, it's the room tag um, which is picking up all those shared parameters. So it's just a label uh, within the room tag. So when, in a normal sort of scenario, when you're labeling each room, you have that sheet rather than a small piece of text. Um, and it's just an operation of each label. Right. And so then you're placing each one of those through a call out into a sheet. Is it a manual um, set of quantities for your furniture that's in the rooms? What, sorry? Are you manually quantifying the uh, furniture? Um, yes, yeah, so that's how we start off with the key schedule. Um, so you, it's sort of like different room stages, so you add more information as you go along. So your room, your key schedule um, has generic information, not room specific. So then when you start modeling rooms, you can apply each key schedule uh, category to the dependent room. That will give you generic information across your building. Um, at that point, you can export it again to Excel, or you can then adapt the main room data sheet uh, further down the line. And that's when you're putting specific information in. But um, because most of it's filled out with generic information, it's saving you a lot of time. Mm. Yeah, it's just a shared parameter, so you can create anything really, as long as it's room based, or you could do a door shift with the door based, so. Thanks, sir. <laughs> so, Andrew suggested this one as well, and of course I would be amiss not to suggest this one as well, given who I work for. Um, so it's, um, <laughs> so it's uh, the XI Tech Toolkit, um, which is, uh, I, you know, of course I'm completely biased on this particular one, although I would point out it's free, so I'm not making any money. Um, the, um, so this, uh, this particular tool allows us to um, uh, schedule out um, XYZ coordinates, um, of pretty much anything, but the one that we 
The one that we seem to find that most people use it for, and probably the one we, we envisage it being used for as well, was piling, structural piling, piling positions and that sort of thing. And, and people have found it extremely useful for setting out on-site piling locations and all that kind of thing. And we've had, um, we've had a number of very good co comments back. That's how you use it as well, is it, at Fairhouse? So drainage locate basically anything you want to locate, isn't it? Mm, it's 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 we've had it around for a few years now, and people are sort of discovering it. It's surprisingly high download rate from our website, um, but yeah, people do seem to find it very useful. Um, the other um, the other tool that's in there is a renumbering tool as well. Um, I, I had a bit of a hand in developing this one. Um, when I say I had a hand in it, I told other people what I wanted in it, and they did the clever bit. Um, but the, um, but the, the, basically what it does, what it can do is it can take any element. Again, most people are going to use it for doors and, and that sort of thing, door scheduling, that sort of thing. But you can, you can take any element, and, you, and it will renumber those elements. It will change the mark number that's in those, uh, in those particular elements. Um, and it can do it either by, there's a few ways it can do it. You can either pick the objects one at a time and have it renumber them that way. That's one way of doing it. Um, it will, uh, what I quite like though is it will go across horizontally as well. So it will go across a view horizontally in rows and renumber that way. It will also go down vertically as well and renumber that way. The other way it will renumber as well is by room. So you can sort of say this is room number five, door number one. So it will, it will name it 5-1 or whatever, or whatever syntax you want to use to number it. Um, you can also apply suffixes and prefixes and things like that into there as well. So there's a really good number of uh, a really good number of options. It'll auto tag everything for you, all that sort of thing. So it's a really good way of, you know, if you've got something you need to renumber, be it structural piles, be it doors within a system, be it diffusers in an MEP system, you can use that tool to do it. Again, it's free of charge. It's just on the website. You just grab it and download it of your own choice. Yes, sir. Hmm. Uh, we could. Uh, I'm not. To be honest, I'm not sure of the answer. It's. Uh, it's not something I've tried. But essentially, we can get. It's. It's just doing the origin. So we can, as long as there's an. I would imagine with a system. Go on, Kevin. Oh, go on. Sorry. Um, so the. Uh, I think. I think as long as it's. I think it'll probably take the start point of the wall. But I've never actually tried it. So. We'll have to we'll have to give it a go. Kevin. <laughs> well, basically, you, you, if you did it in two stages, so in other words, if you renumbered your rooms first and did those in the particular sequence. So, if you, for example, if you wanted your rooms renumbered horizontally and then or vertically, or you wanted just to pick them, then you use the tool once to do that, and then rerun the tool again to um, uh, to do the numbers by uh, do the doors by room, and that would achieve what you're after, I think. Yes, to other parameters. Yes, we have uh, we have allowed you to bring in other parameters and use the data from those. That's this function here. Level, I'm not sure about because just programmatically, I know there's some issues with using level data in in this kind of software. Um, so again, I'd have to go and check and find out. I've never done it, but potentially, I'm not sure. Um, another thing I should mention about the toolkit as well is that we're about to release some new functionality. Um, it's not quite. I was hoping you would get it out before this meeting, actually. I was trying to give people a gentle push in the right direction, but I never quite got there. Um, but we are bringing out a tool that allows you to position objects in Revit by a, uh, by a coordinate. So, um, so, you know, one of the things that, um, one of the things that we've had quite a lot of people tell us is that you know, the one thing they miss when they come away from AutoCAD is that they want to position something that's at a, a, an X, Y, Z coordinate, or they want to position something about that's on an OS coordinate or something like that, and they just can't do it because Revit doesn't have the function. Or equally, they want to do it by um, they want to do it by relative coordinates. So they want to say, you know, this is my this is my zero zero zero. I want it to be 
50 by 50 over here sort of thing and put it there rather than having to as you do in Revit at the moment have to move it up 50 and then move it across 50 which is what you have to kind of do right now which is a bit dumb so um, so um, there is that tool and it should be out in the next few weeks actually so it should become part of the toolkit then so just keep an eye out for that So this, I'm not sure if I can call this an app or not, but I've snuck it in here just on the, uh, just on the, uh, just on the fact that it's just come out. Who's heard of it? Okay. And there's a big question, and I, I'm pretty sure no hands will go up here, but I'll, I'll be corrected. Anybody using it? One. Go on. Are you using it on the project too? Oh, very good. Yeah, it's 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 a really useful uh, useful tool. It's just been released into the UK just in the last few weeks. Um, it's a tool that is allowing us to collaborate uh, multi geographically. So, uh, who uses Revit Server? A couple of you. Yeah, I can tell because you look stressed out. Um, the um, <laughs> the uh, the Revit Server software. Let's be honest, is horrible. You know, it was a solution which came about as a result of people saying that we don't have a solution, so Autodesk very quickly suddenly put something out there, and it was a bit of an afterthought, to be honest, I think, and I don't think Autodesk would mind too much be saying that. Maybe they would. Um, but, the, um, but, you know, Autodesk Revit Server, you need to have quite, if you want to have, and it's, it's about enabling that kind of workflow where you've got, you know, someone in London, someone in Glasgow, someone in Paris, you got three people here, two people, uh, one person, two people here, and a person here, and they're all working on the same project. You know, one of the issues that they've got, of course, is if you start, and I'm sure most of us who have used Revit have got some knowledge of work sharing, but if you sync your changes to the central file, and you go through this nice fast, you go through this nice fast LAN local area network, and all of a sudden you hit this horrible slow. You put all sorts of acceleration technologies in there in the vain hope that it will work, um, and it will. And you put um, and you put the uh, you put the through that wide area network. And this person, this lady here, is ringing you up and saying, "I, I press the sync button, and now I'm going to go and make my dinner for the evening because that's how long it's taking to sync it." It's um, it will cause a lot of slowdown in that um, in that particular process if you try and do direct links. So Revit Server came along. Um, I don't know what was it five six years ago, and um, and they they enabled it so we could put servers in each of these locations, and we could sync our changes up to those servers, releasing this person to carry on working as they would with a traditional work sharing environment, and then the Revit server transmit those changes through the slower network, resulting in a, a much faster, much slicker experience for everybody. However, the problem with Revit server is it needed dedicated servers to be set up, which needed a lot of IT expertise, and it also needed a lot of, um, uh, it also, the servers themselves are not particularly cheap. So it was, you know, especially for SMEs and, and smaller organizations, not particularly attractive as a proposition to, uh, to solving that problem. So along comes um, A360 Collaboration for Revit, which was released in the US at the beginning of 2015, came to the UK just a few weeks ago, um, and um, and it allows us to um, it allows us to use the Autodesk's servers. Those of you who are in security will suddenly gasp, um, but the, uh, it allows us to host our models on Autodesk servers, and it allows us to effectively synchronize our changes to Autodesk's servers which are then disseminated through anybody with an internet connection. So anybody with an internet connection and a piece of Revit software can link up to that model which is on that server and sync their changes through it. And it's very clever in the way it works. We're seeing it vastly increase the synchronization times and stuff like that. It also uses A360 Team, which is again, it's not new A360 Team, but it's not very widely known. A360 Team is a kind of a, an environment where we can put our files and we can collaborate and share them with others and we can share them within our framework, we can have project administrators and we can grant access to it as well. So, sorry about my rather terrible diagrams but hopefully it explains good enough. So we can have a, we can have a uh, situation, whether it's a good idea or not we'll debate 
until the until the sheep come home. But uh, you could have it where an architectural model is here going through, and they've got all the local files down here, and this has been synced up to live. You can have it where the MEP model is in the team environment and the structural model where it's in the team environment as well. And yes, basically that means that this person can link in this model and this person can link in this model if you give access rights. And therefore, the MEP engineer, when this person makes a change and synchronizes the change, the MEP engineer will see that change immediately. Um, so it's dynamic, live, interactive working. And if it if uh, if someone doesn't end up with caught at some point in doing it, I would be I would be massively surprised. But it's it does carry its um, it does carry its um, it does carry its risks. Obviously, there has to be a trusting relationship there, because if this person changes, uh, we, we we discussed a few scenarios with an Exitech. Architect removes the ceiling, syncs up the changes. MEP engineer's got the light fixtures hosted on the ceiling. Yes, the ceiling fixtures are going to be deleted in the MEP model. So, um, so uh, you know, there is a whole bunch of uh, whole bunch of problems. Structural engineer is messing around with some new idea that they're trying out. You know, they haven't really finalised that idea. Trying dif dif different dif different steelwork arrangements. Architect sees those changes, not realising that they're not really a sort of issue, if you like, and reacts it's, reacts to that change, changes their design. Structural engineer changes back their design, and now we've got some kind of weird circle going on where this person now has to react to the changes that are going on up here. So it's it's not without its issues, but some people in the states, particularly, have switched to that way of working, and have decided that it, the, the downsides to it are outweighed by the positives of reactive design. Debate, as you wish. Slightly less of <laughs> an app. I, did, I was a bit sneaky putting that one in there. Um, but the uh, 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 slightly less of an app is the file upgrader. A lot of people use this. I think it's probably one of the most popular apps, in fact. Um, but the um, the upgrader, if you ran it in Revit 2016, and I think it's available right down to 2012, I think. Um, if you run it in 2016, um, it will scan a folder, and it will scan it for Revit projects, RVTs, component files, RFAs, and Revit templates, RTEs, and it will um, it will um, it will upgrade them to whatever version that you're currently in, and it will save a copy of them in another folder. It doesn't it doesn't overwrite the original version. Very useful if you've got a content library, for example, that's in 2015 and you've moved up to 2016, you can upgrade it all. Although, I don't, you know, if you're doing big project files, it will take a while to get through, so don't leave it, don't do it, think it's going to take, be a quick thing. Say again? No, it's just Autodesk's actually, it's just on the Autodesk Exchange, or Autodesk App Store. It's not even, it's not a subscription at all. Oh, okay. I will switch to this then, because there's no point paying for some of that. It's free in there. Yeah. Sorry, just one more question. But this one does not check the file version before you open it, right? Just upgrade. Yeah, upgrade anything. It'll just scan the whole folder for anything, regardless of version, and upgrade it. Yeah. Hmm. If they're linked in at the time, yeah. Yeah. There is actually a bit of a problem, um, uh, which I've discovered that um, with. Sometimes with um, link files, when it's scanning, when it's scanning, it sort of gets itself into a circle sometimes because link files are in link files are in link files, and it sort of tries to upgrade the link within the link, and it ends up in a circle and crashes itself. So you've got to be a bit, uh, you've got to, you've got to keep an eye on it. Yeah. So it's source directory, destination directory. Yeah. Yeah, it does, yeah. Yeah, yeah. so if you've got a component library, which is all in it. The weird thing is that, um, and I found this out with the metric library, in fact, is that if you've got a, a, a set of folders, but you don't have any files in the top-level folder, so in other words, it's just a folder full of folders, if, they, if you like, it doesn't work. It, work <laughs> it, doesn't, it doesn't start it. You've actually got to go and copy like a, just a single family into the main folder, and then start it, and then it goes for all the folders and do it. It's just a weird programming thing that it's got. <laughs> So, but yeah, as long as you know that, you're okay. Uh, Dynamo, who's using Dynamo? 
David puts his hands up at this point, definitely. Anybody else? Yeah, it's a cool bit of kit, let's be honest. If you're not using Dynamo because you're scared of it, don't be, because I used it last week, and if I can use it, trust me, you can. Um, it's, um, it's, it's, a, it's a really, um, it's a really, you, you can be forgiven for when you first open it, sort of closing it back down again, God, I'm not looking at that, that scares the heck out of me. But, um, but, the, um, but in reality, it's actually, um, it's actually not that bad. Especially because the Dynamo community, that, which exists at um, dynamobim.org, you know, it's, it's a really, really good community. You can just do a search on it and you're guaranteed to find the problem that somebody, you know, find the issue that you're having which somebody else has already solved. The amount of times I just constantly cheat when I'm building up scripts. I, I, I build something up, I try a couple of things to try and do it myself and then I, and then I get bored and then I go on the internet and I Google it and I find the answer. It's usually, um, it's usually very, or I, or I email Kevin or David and they give me the answer. It's, <laughs> it's, um, it's, it's a very, um, it's a very, uh, it's a very, very useful tool. And you can do all sorts of stuff that you just couldn't do in normal vanilla Revit, if you like. So, you know, one of the things that I had to do recently as a client asked me, they said, can you, we've got all these parameters in our, in our models. Um, can you tell us what category those parameters are installed in and which parameters have been completed and filled out? To which I went, I don't think I can. Until I looked in Dynamo and just realized that it was dead easy. It took about eight nodes and then it was done sort of thing. It was, uh, it, it was, it was really quite easy and it exported it all out to Excel very, very, very quickly and all that sort of thing. So, and if you're doing geometry editing, you know, if you want to control that geometry and make sure that, you know, if you've got a, if you've got, um, I used it for roof design once with purlins, structural purlins. You know, if you want to make sure that things redistribute themselves parametrically rather than having to go manually sort of replace them all, programmatically, Dynamo is going to eat that for breakfast. It's, it's brilliant. <laughs> the amount of times I've, yeah, I've come across problems that I realised I could have solved in about ten minutes with Dynamo that took me two days to sort of solve. You know, in the past, you know, it's 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 anything. And I've I've kind of written it there. If you've got a, if you've got a task that's repetitive or requires lots of steps or needs any continuous management, use Dynamo because it's going to solve the problem probably. <laughs> This probably comes from the fact that I tend to have to manage content creation projects now. Um, but one of the things that we've got is um, um, a need to, uh, I've got, I might, I might be developing 70 families. And then somebody tells me that I have to install a param I have to install three parameters into 70 families. Who wants to do that with normal Revit? <laughs> All right. Uh, Sumux, oh, sorry, Spectrum as it's now called, it used to be called Sumux. Um, $99. Which is, you know, what less than an hour of your time at business rate probably. Um, it's going to um, it's it scans the uh, it scans the all those families. It allows you to set the properties of the shared parameter and it'll install it all in all 70 family all 70 families for you, without you having to do anything else. It'll do 70. It'll do 100 families in about two minutes. Install the parameters in every single one of them. Yeah. Equally, it can strip out all the parameters if you wanted to. So again, somebody changes a parameter, says, says that parameter's not named correctly. You know, in all these families, you want to strip it out, it'll do it within about, within a couple of minutes. So it really does automate that process. Funny enough, I was thinking sort of, as I put this after Dynamo, you could probably do it with Dynamo as well, to be honest, but it's, um, but it's nicely wrapped up in a nice interface for $99, so you might as well do it through that. So there you go. That's a summary. That presentation took a bit longer than I'd anticipated, but hopefully you found it interesting. Any questions?